Welcome to the Next Gen Podcast. Stepping up to the microphone are your hosts, Bryson Wright and Alex Winton. They got next, so let's get to the show. What is up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Gen Podcast here on the Bluff City Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Bryson Wright, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alex Winton. And we got a lot of great stuff to get to today, uh, starting with NBA Finals. We got some NBA Draft stuff and the USA Women's Basketball Team roster just got announced this week. So full show today. But got to start with NBA Finals. Uh, Celtics lead 2-0. Not surprising. I think we both kind of said we expected the Celtics to win, even though the Mavericks obviously had a great run to the finals and everything like that. It just, to me, like watching these first two games, you just see how the Mavericks' margin of error is so small, right? Like the Mavericks have to be perfect to win these games, whereas the Celtics, you can survive with Jason Tatum. I mean, he's average. I think in the first two games, he's averaging like 17. Right, yeah, so it's not, even like, it's not even like he's going crazy, but you have so many other people where you have a Derek White game, and you know Jalen Brown's been playing awesome, Kristaps Porzingis. Um, this game for me, this was really a Derek White game for me. Like Andrew Holiday, those two in Game Two, that block that Derek White had at the end of the game is one of the most impressive plays I've seen like all season, really. Just because he he's not the guy that you really expect. Like obviously he's a good defender, but. I was not expecting him to get up like that, like on on that on that last one, uh, because the Mavericks. I mean, they played good most of the game. Luca was incredible, but I feel like the Celtics the Celtics game plan on defense worked really well because they decided like they're not really going to try to double Luca as much, and they're like they're going like look Luca can go one on one all he wants, and they are basically trying to shut down most of the other people, especially Kyrie, and Kyrie has just shot the ball horribly. Like, he, he, he just has not been playing up to his standards. And this is what I was saying the other day. I was like, if the if the Mavericks want to have a chance to win this series, Luka and Kyrie – well, Kyrie at least got to be 25-plus points a game. It, it, yeah. Like, if they want to win these games. And what he's done in the first two games is just not going to cut it. Like, he, 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 he they need the Kyrie that they had in the last series. Uh, but, the, but the Celtics have done a good a good job of really slowing him down. I feel like they just have so many different defenders that they can throw at them. Whether mm-hmm. you want, like, obviously Drew Holiday and Derek White are both awesome defenders. But if you're if you're having switches, it's like okay, you got Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. If you're switching somebody onto them, so none of those guys are bad defenders, and they all have length. And it's it's tough, man. Like the Celtics' defense is really what stood out to me uh, these last two games because. Like we said coming into this, like Luka and Kyrie is one of the best offensive backcourts that we've seen. But the Celtics have really limited them, especially limited in Kyrie. Uh, Luka has been Luka. Like Luka is going to – he had, what, like a 32-point triple-double? Yeah, he almost had a double in the first game too. Yeah, like like Luka is going to be Luka, and I think the Celtics are okay with that, especially because like tonight it really just felt like Luka ran out of gas. I mean – that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You're throwing all these different defenders at him, and he had he had 23 in the uh, what 23 in the first half, and yeah. mm-hmm. he 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 was like he was doing everything. He was getting assists, he, but but it just felt like down the stretch of the game, uh, like he he like I said, he had 23 in the first half, and he finished with 32, right? So that just kind of shows you that in the second half, I think you know some of the injury stuff. You know, he's not 100 percent added on to the fact they have so many good defenders. That he he did like it, it was going to be hard for him to like f- for them to win game two. Luca probably needed to would have needed to have like 40 45. Like, that's really what would have had to happen based on how everybody else was playing. And down the stretch of the game, I mean, he he made so he made good plays, he made great plays like he always does, but they, he just they didn't get enough from everybody else. And yeah, specifically Kyrie, like, I'll be honest, yeah. specifically they, they did not get enough from, from Kyrie. Because, like, in terms of role players and stuff, I mean, it's not like they had horrible production from their role players. You know what I mean? I mean, like, P.J. Washington had 17. Derrick Jones Jr. had 11. Daniel Gafford, 13. Like, that's that, that's kind of what you expected from them. But Kyrie Kyrie can't be 7 for 18 if they're going to win yeah. against the Celtics. And it's just that simple. 
Yeah, stars got to be stars here. I'm looking at it now. Kyrie's getting outscored by PJ Washington in the first two games. Like that can't, that can't happen. But yeah, I, I, I mean, to what you're talking about, yeah, we both had Boston talk. You know, winning the series. Obviously, I had them. I said it before the game. I had them winning this game in a close one. I thought the Mavericks were going to play better, which they did. They started out very well. They they had probably the best. Like they couldn't. You couldn't ask for a better start. I think they end up leading like 18 to six or something like that. But then it seems like Boston just kind of settled into the game. And the thing is with Boston, that what everybody was worried about is that when they can't hit shots from three, are they going to be able to still sustain a, a game where they can win and grind it out? And they were able to basically do that because they – at halftime, I think they were up three. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Kyrie at that point, he was he was playing pretty well at that point. I think he had like 12, 10 or 12 points at that time on like good efficiency. I think Luka had 20, like you said, 23. So they basically had like 30-some points combined. And then Jalen Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum both were not great at by halftime. I think they had like 13 points combined. And then I think the the Celtics only made like two threes and they were still up three. Like we talked about margin of error. Like they just don't have the margin of error to sustain all this for at least seven games. Like I, I think next game will be interesting, obviously. But like for just the Mavs in general, just it's hard for them to sustain this level of play if you're not gonna have like the stand, like you have to at least have Luca and Kyrie go crazy, like. That has to be the standard. And so, like you said, honestly, because looking at the box score, I'd have to look at it again. I was thinking, I mean, now granted, Kyrie's got to make more shots, but obviously even Lucas even said they all got to make more shots in general, at least from the perimeter. Derrick Jones Jr. has got to give them more, obviously, because he was hitting shots before, but now he's not. But again, this is on the road, so that does make a difference, and they might play better at home. But yeah, just looking at it now, yeah, Kyrie's got to play much better, like you said, just because if you're getting 17 from P.J. Washington, 13 from Gafford, and 11 from Jones, like, you you need to probably another – six. Kyrie's at 16, you probably need 30. You know what I mean? Like, on, on this team as constructed. But um, Well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, if Kyrie has 25 tonight instead of 16, they win by two. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. And, and, and that's, and that's kind of what I'm saying. Uh, but the other thing is you're not going to beat – like, this is the worst shooting, like, the Celtics have had in a while. I mean, they only made 10 threes, which that's yeah, not yeah. characteristic then, of them, but yeah, exactly. Dallas made six. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you, you're not going to beat the Celtics making six threes. Even like, this is the worst, this is the worst shooting night you're probably going to see from them. Like 10, yeah. like, they were 10 for 39. That's, yeah. that's probably not going to happen again. So that's yeah, why, that's why I am worried about the Mavericks. Now, obviously they're on 2-0, so you should be worried, but I'm like, you, this is the game, especially when you look at the other times they lost game one in the series. They won game two, in the and uh, in, in, uh, when they played the Thunder, they did that. When they played the Clippers, they did that. You got it. Like if you lose game one on the road, they needed they needed that game to win, and they just they just couldn't they they couldn't get it done. Even though the Celtics, the Celtics did try. The Celtics tried really hard to lose that game, like for for a little bit, like down the stretch. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that's kind of what we've seen from them, like. Like not to say that they can't close out games. Obviously, they closed out game one and they had a great game. But they always have one out of those first two games at home, where it's almost like down the stretch. Like in the fourth quarter, it really felt like they were trying to lose for a little bit uh, when they kind of let the yeah Mavericks. last like two minutes. Yeah, those last two yeah minutes like the sure. last like three minutes. I was, it was like okay, like you've been playing great for forty five minutes, and now you just let them go on a nine zero run. Like what's going on? But I, I I think I think it's the Celtics to lose. I think they're gonna win at least one of these games in Dallas, and at this point, it it I really feel like it could be Celtics and five at this point. Like I would not well, be surprised. I, well, well, I say five or six, so that's where that's where I I mean I'm still gonna you know kind of stick with it. And I will say this too, you gotta think. I know people, you know, Jason Tatum has been a topic of discussion because his percentages have not been great, but I mean he's basically leading them rebounds and assists and doing everything else. Like you have to think. Obviously, I'm not saying Tatum's gonna go for like forty the next two games. But you have to thank Tatum at some point because he's done it the last – basically every series since the Miami series or the Cleveland – like really the Cleveland series game two, he's had games of 30. Like you think Tatum is probably going to play somewhat better, and that's the thing. He hasn't played great at all. Like Brown's giving you what you think Brown is, Drew Hodden. But if Tatum's really the team – you know, I know the whole discussion best, but Tatum is not playing up to his standard scoring-wise. So if he even takes a step up, that makes their margin even more smaller for Dallas because it's like if he has a 30 game, 30 ball, like next game, like it's gonna be kind of tough. And you're talking about if Brown's still playing that same way, Drew Holiday's still playing the same. Because I'm looking at it now, 
they're not really, I mean, Derek White and Drew Hyde are shooting the ball well, but Jalen Brown and Tatum are shooting 28% from three. Porzingis too, like, they're not shooting the ball really great in, in both of these. Like, tonight they didn't, and even in the first game. So that's the thing. They still have areas to improve in, in spite of already being up too well. So when you think about it like that, it's like, it, it just gets harder and harder for me to see a situation where Dallas uh, overcomes this for, like I said, it's in seven games. Like, I, I, I can see them, like you said, winning the game. And I think they'll probably win that next game, but it's just for a seven game series, it's hard to beat this team. Like you gotta be, you gotta be perfect. Not even perfect, but I mean, damn near perfect. Like it's hard to do. Especially, and for this team, Dallas is how they're constructed. Cause like we talked about with matches matter, they just don't have, I don't think they have the offensive guys consistently every night to do that. Whereas like Drew Hardy is literally, I said it on Twitter, Drew Hardy is literally the fourth option. And he had like 26 tonight. Like, the fourth option. Just think about that. Twenty six tonight. Fourth it's option. Insane. It's insane. You know I mean? And, and like, <laughs> like I, there are people who are saying that Drew Holiday could be Finals MVP, and it's like, dude, he really could. Like, just because Listen, I, don't, I don't know who's gonna win a Finals MVP on their team. But yeah, go ahead. Could. I mean, because none of the people, like the people that played the best in the first game, didn't didn't play the best in the second game. Like that. Like that's really the difference. I mean, Jalen Brown might be the front runner right now, but I don't know. Like Jason Tatum is going to get some benefit of the a doubt just because people know the type of player he is, and I feel like he's the type where if he does have one or two really good games, yeah, the thirty balls, yeah, yeah, the if average he has thirty ball, go up. and the, yeah, the average is going to go up. And the other thing is, like, he had twelve assists. He, he he did have twelve assists tonight, so I will give him credit for that. Uh, and in, in the game before that, you know, he had like five assists. So, but he really should have had more assists in game one. I I think I saw a stat that said uh, if like based on the passes he made, he could have had up to fourteen assists instead of five. So there was yeah. nine times where he created open shots that people missed. So it's one of those things where even even though Jason Tatum like Jason Tatum shot six for twenty two is not good, but I feel like he still he still affected the game because you know he's always going to play defense and he made the right play more often than not. Like. Yeah. From uh, and, and like you know, obviously he, he took some tough shots. Star players take tough shots, right? But I don't think he took a bunch of shots that were like out of the flow with the offense and got people out of rhythm. And he made the right play more often than not. And that's and that's really like, I mean, that's a sign of growth from any young player. Uh, is it if, if if you can make the right play when when it comes down to it? Like I know he had he had a couple really good passes down the stretch of that game. So I will give him credit for that. Uh, and then, dude, Drew Holiday was 11 for 14. <laughs> like, that's – and that's why I – like, role players are so important, even though Drew Holiday is, like, to the point to where he's a role player on the Celtics just yeah. because that that's how good the Celtics are. For most yeah. teams, you know, even though he might not be your first scoring option, I don't even know if I consider him a role player if he was on most teams. He's probably, like, your third best player. Which, yeah. you know, is kind of how you're saying. But, like, on this team, he's, like, fourth, fifth best player, like, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Uh, no, throw in option, yeah. Second order is, is crazy. Like, sometimes their right might be the, the th fourth option or third option, whatever the case we want to call it. So. Yeah, for sure. And then, like I said, this really felt like a Derek White game to me. I mean, he he, he scored the ball well, had 18. Uh, that block that he had at the end of the game, that was insane. Like, that's one of the more impressive blocks I've seen, especially considering the fact that the Mavericks had all the momentum. Then uh, they're on the fast break. He gets the block, and then the, the Celtics come down and score, and that was basically what ended the game. Uh, yeah. Because the Mavericks score right there, and they're cutting it to a one-possession game. And then, you know, they're a stop and a Luka crazy step back. I mean, we've seen what Luka, the shots Luka can hit, <laughs> right? So if it's a three-point game and Luka Doncic has the ball, anything can happen. We saw the four-point play he made against the Timberwolves where they almost swept them off of that, right? Obviously, they didn't win that game, but it's like that was such an important play. Uh, and it's like, and that's really like the difference, I think, between the Celtics and some of the other teams. It's really just like the role players. To have a guy like Derek White uh, make those big plays, even though Jason Tatum wasn't having a good game. To have a guy like Drew Holiday uh, to go out and score 26 and grab 11 rebounds. Like that's that's just big time plays, and that's and that's and that's why I was talking about people that have been there before, having veterans, yeah. why people that have you know been in championship games before, even though the Celtics haven't won it before, 
like everybody on the team has been to the playoffs. Everybody's been on deep playoff runs. They have the continuity, all of that. And then you bring in a guy like Drew Holiday, who has the championship experience. Uh, Al Horford, who obviously, you know, what is isn't a huge scoring option, but he does what he needs to do on defense. Uh, and then when he does get his opportunities, I mean, he, he's a guy that might only be taking four or five shots most games, but he has had those nights when they really needed him to step up where he stepped up. Um, and that's the kind of guys you need, especially when you get to the finals. Like that, that that's what that's, that's the kind of guys you need. So I think the first the Celtics should feel really good. Obviously they're up 2-0. If they can get one of these two in Dallas, I, like I think they're probably going to win in five because I think if they if they go back to Boston up three one, I think they're probably going to finish finish it off. So, uh, I really felt like it, it's so weird to call things a must win before, like you know what I mean. Like I don't want to say the game two was like a must win for the Mavericks, but it kind of felt like that in terms of if they really wanted to be in control of the series and not playing from behind, because now they're really just playing catch up the whole time. Like now you got to win these two games. Yeah, game, game three is a desperation game. Like you can't go to yeah. 0-3. It, it, oh, yeah. So game three, game three, it, this is basically win or go home. Right. Cause obviously I guess they could, but they're not, they're not going to beat the Celtics four times in a row. Like that's just not going to happen. I don't know if the Celtics lost four games in a row the whole season. Like, <laughs> especially not to the same team. Barely two, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to go look at it, but it's probably I, – I, I don't even think they lost two. I think they lost, like, two in a row, like, once or something like that. It's some crazy stat like that. I guess but, yeah, I mean – and and that's the thing. I mean, the Celtics have been the most dominant team in the NBA most of the season. Uh, and then, like we talked about last week on the preview, they just have so many different guys that they can throw at Luke and Kyrie to make it tough on them, uh, specifically Kyrie, too. And I think they like it's been like Kyrie has struggled, especially in the second half. Like I, it really felt like it was the second half where he struggled the most in game two, which is kind of the opposite of what we've seen for the rest of the playoffs, where he might take a back seat in the first half and then really exploded in the second half. But he just he hasn't been doing it this series. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, not to say it's over. It's definitely not over because Dallas is definitely good enough to win these next two games. Uh, but game three is a must win. Like game three is a must win game, or yeah. the series definitely over. Like they're not going to beat the Celtics four times in a row, especially considering the fact that game five and game seven would both have to be in Boston too. Is I, I just don't see that happening. Yeah, and I just checked. Yeah, Boston never lost three games in a row. They only lost two a lot of times, but they never lost three games in a row this whole season. So, and like you said, they, <laughs> that and. They, yeah, yeah. I, I just looked at it literally. It's just two, like two losses here. It's like a bunch of wins, two losses, a bunch of wins, two losses, a bunch of wins. So, like, and again, like you said, they got two games at home, even in that situation. So yeah, game three, they're gonna play with a bunch of desperation. Um, and and again, I do probably expect them to win just because it's like, I think Kyrie does play better, and I think they're gonna have like you know, or I think I won't say Boston will have a letdown, but then you also have to think about the Porzingis thing where. Uh, he seemed like he re- – well, I don't know how bad he hurt himself. He was limping a little bit, so that could play a factor. So, you know, it's not technically over, but, again, this is a big game. Like, again, like for, for at least Dallas, this is like a win or go home type of thing. Tonight, like you said, this game was more of a – if you wanted to, like, not play from – you know, be in desperation mode, but more so in, like, not driver's seat, but, like, had a real flip of the coin chance to, like, take the series, like the swing game, basically. You know, that could have been the game tonight. But again, you know, if Boston just took care of home court, so you know that's kind of how they got to look at it, and probably how they look at it because, you know, for the most part, outside of game one, yeah, in game one where they got they got blown out, but even then they won the quarters after that, and then tonight they played close for most of the time. They probably they don't feel you know all the way bad. They feel like they can make a couple plays here and there. Um, they can you know they still have a chance in this, um, but again, they got to make it in game three because again, um, you know, it's just a win or go home situation. But yeah. You know, shout out to Boston. Obviously, they've been like you said. The experience is the biggest thing I've said about this, or at least tonight it showed because like Drew Holiday's been here before, and it just seemed like he has been here before. Obviously, outside of basically Port and their main rotation outside of Porzingis and Hauser, everybody else has either made a finals or won a finals because Derek White, all them, you know, Al Horford, all them were on the 2022 team, and obviously they've had experience of being the bunch of conference finals. So you know, you can just tell that they've been there. 
Um, and that's why you see big plays like Derek White making that block. Um, and even I think Drew Holiday had a couple key plays where he made like a steal here, got an offensive rebound that led to an and one here, like little stuff like that always adds up. It's just the little winning plays like that. Those are the key things. I think even Tatum hit a big shot. I know Tatum shot the ball terribly, but, but he hit a big swing three. I think it was like at a pitiful time where they think they went up like double digits. Like little stuff like that always adds up. Those little momentum plays always add up. Um, so, you know, I, again, they, 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 they should feel good. But obviously, I think Dallas shouldn't feel too bad at least. I know they're down 2-0. But again, like we've seen before, like we've seen teams be seem like they're in control. And then, they go, you know, the, the other team goes back home and then the whole series flips. So, you know, it, it's to be determined. But, again, I, I think, you know, I, I, at least I feel decent about my Boston pick. I feel decent for now. You know, this could change in a week. You know, we'll see how this, this, this following week goes. But I feel decent about the Boston pick. I, I'll be – I'd be surprised um, if Dallas came back and really won the series. I can see, you know, them compete. But winning the series, it'd be hard for me to see. Yeah, for sure, 100%. But, yeah, obviously we'll continue to keep everybody updated with the finals, our thoughts and everything like that. But we do kind of got to get to some Grizzlies news, as always, with the draft being 15 days away or six, 16 days away. Yeah, something like that. We're releasing this 16 days away. And we have some reported draft interest that the Grizzlies have. Uh, some names that we've talked about before, some names that maybe we haven't talked about that, you know, are kind of making a push. Uh, so obviously Donovan Klingon, Dalton Connect, Devin Carter, Zach Eady, Tristan Da Silva, Johnny Furphy. Those are the names from Jonathan Giveney, which is basically the biggest ESPN draft expert. You know, he's goes to basically if there's a draft prospect there, Jonathan Giveney <laughs> is there. Like I'm telling you, I, I see the stuff on his Twitter where he's watching like uh he's like at a random Euro League game watching somebody. And then be like, oh, this this guy might be really good in the 2027 class. And I'm like, what? Like, what are you even talking about? So, like, it's, it's, it's really crazy. He He's really tapped in on all that kind of stuff. Uh, but so out of that list of players, I mean, I, I'll start. I think we can start with the Klingon stuff just because I know we have talked about Klingon being an option in the past and stuff like that. But I really just don't know. He's not going to be there at nine. And honestly, you don't think so? No, I mean, you he's not gonna be there at nine. Clinging, bro. This draft, I'm not surprised by anybody going fall. Like outside of Sar, bro, I, I'm not sold on anybody being like high or low. Like, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised I, by anything. I, I feel like Clinging is I feel like Clinging is at the least top six. At the least. That, that and that's just based on everything I've seen. So I feel like he's not gonna be there at nine. And just as more stuff comes out about it, like if the Grizzlies had in the lottery ended up getting the fifth pick or the fourth pick or something like that, and he was there, I would be okay if they had drafted him. But are you really willing to use more assets to trade up to get him? That's going to be my main question. And for me, I don't know if I'm willing to, you know, trade another future first round pick, especially not in next year's draft, which is supposed to be better in order to draft Klingon this year, when I do think you can, there there are better players you could trade for, established players you could trade for, where you could trade, you know, you could trade out or trade back, not trade completely out, but trade back, get a better player, and then still draft one of these other guys that you're, that you're interested in, if it's at 14 or 15 or something like that, right? So I don't know if this is the draft where you necessarily trade up, right? Now I know Zach yeah. Kleiman in the past has shown that if, if if like if Zach Kleiman really wants Donovan Klingon, he's gonna trade up for him. Like he he's he he, that, he he has shown that in the past. Me personally, I'm I'm not I'm not sure if I want to trade up for him. I think I'd rather if it was between trading up for Klingon or then getting like an established veteran, uh, trading for an established veteran, maybe using some of the assets you already have the team and still drafting a non center and nine. I'd be okay with that. But trading up for Klingon, I just don't know how much sense that would really make for now. Just because, I mean, he, he, he it, the same for him and Zach Eady. I think both of them, they're kind of similar in terms of the, the concerns that you have about them. Uh, because, I mean, when you watch the playoffs, you watch, even though Rudy Gobert was defensive player of the year, 
you watch sometimes down the stretch in the playoffs, he's almost unplayable, right? And he's one of the best defenders on the planet. Klingon, I think, is a good rim protector. Is he a Rudy Gobert level rim protector right now? No, he's not. And I don't know if he's even as quick. And I say the same thing about Zach Eady. I mean, both of them, I, I just don't know how if they they might get played off the court in playoff series. And I think you're the one that actually told me this, that uh, Donovan Klingon is like a Steven Adams clone. Yeah. <laughs> and even though Steven Adams was awesome for the Grizzlies, he did get played off the court during the playoffs. So it's one of those things, like, if you do draft Klingon, I'm not saying it would be a bad pick, just because I think during the regular season, that's a guy that can eat up minutes, get a bunch of boards, and be a secondary exactly. sector next to, next to Jaron. But for either of them, I, are they 80? Not, they might be 82 game players. I don't know yeah. if they're necessarily the 16 game players that the Grizzlies are going to be wanting in order to like win the championship, right? But I think I think in the regular season you'll be fine if you do draft Klingon. It, it would just be interesting to see what happens now if you do end up playing somebody like the Nuggets and you just need another big body to throw at Jokic. Okay, that's perfect, right? I think I think he could help in that instance. But it's really just going to come down to matchups, whether or not he's going to be able to play in those big games. That's just how I feel. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. And and again, yeah, I I, I like you know I like clinging a lot. I, but I, I I wouldn't. The only way I trade up is if I'm giving up like future seconds. Like if I'm giving up the nine and like a few you know a couple future seconds and maybe like you know like a Zaire or somebody where I'm moving money. Okay, cool. Because but even then, if you're trading up for him, that means you're probably going to be starting him. There's no reason for you to trade up unless you're not going to start him, in my opinion. It just wouldn't make any sense. And so, like you said, that helps from an 82 game perspective. But again, the Grizzlies need 16 game players. Like we've been, I've been, we we've been saying this, but you know, like that's the clear goal. Like they're they've been said this. They need guys that train. You know, we're trying. They're trying to. They've continuously said they want to get guys that help them have playoff success. And so for me, it's like you're going to add not only guys that I have questions about in the playoffs from a, just a from a talent or you know skill perspective, but they also are younger players. Which again, we've already discussed this year or last year where they tripled down on where Zach Climbing tripled down on youth, and it did, it wasn't the right thing to do. And you already have hypothetically speaking in your top seven two young guys in GG and Vince, who probably in my opinion I think should be your only real young guys you should be depending on. So if you add a Klingon or add somebody like that and you want them to start, that's three guys. And for most championship teams, just go look at the Mavs. I know they got Derek Lively, but he's the only real rookie in their rotation. And then, I mean, like real, like legit rotation. I mean, you could add, you could say Hardy and Green are in the rotation, but they're hit or miss in the rotation. They're like 15 minutes a night, 18 minutes a night. But for the most part, like Lively has been the only main rotation guy that's been a young player um, that's contributed. So, and again, I don't think you know these guys are the same type of athletes as him. And again, they still add value, but like for Klingon, at least for me, I think you again, like you said, you might you I, I could see him. he's probably not gonna be there nine, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if he's there nine. I just again with this draft, I think it's all over the place, even though these reports are saying hey, he's gonna be high. I've seen before where we've seen guys be, oh, they're they're gonna go high in the draft, and then they fall the the, the same night or like that same night, like going forward. Like, because I remember people were talking about like I'm trying to think of maybe like it was a last year, maybe like a guy like Cam Whitmore going lottery and he fell all the way to like 23 or like something like that. Like it was something crazy. And so like I'm just not going to, especially in this draft, I'm not going to be surprised by it. I don't think he'll be there, but if he is, I'm I'm more so like stay packed, like you said, and then maybe trade back and get a veteran. Because again, for me, we're in the phase of getting guys that are at least proven, have an NBA experience. So that's where I'm at with it. I'd much rather trade back. But I mean, if Klingon is there, cool like take him for sure you know obviously you know I, I have no problem with him I, I like his game it's just for me again like you said it's more about can I see him being a 16 game guy they're gonna add 82 game value but we're at the point now where it's like I'm not really worried about the 82 games I know we had a bad season this year but there's a lot of reason why we had a bad season I think a lot of it's more so just the health health things but like we saw job Jaron and Bain basically almost be basically like basically they were on the pace to make the play in but I won't say by themselves, but like literally with like a a mediocre roster, with all due respect. So I, I'm not too worried about them in the regular season fully healthy, and you add another piece here, established player here or two, especially with GG and Vince on the fold. So yeah, I think Klingon's pretty good, but I wouldn't trade up for him though. I, I hope they don't trade up for him. Let me say that. 
And I might be wrong, and I look goofy in like six months. Who knows? But don't trade him for Klingon. If he's there at nine, take him, but don't trade up. I'm not trying to give up no future first, especially for 2025, because that class is supposed to be crazy. Don't give up a 2025 yeah, first. Not, I, I think that's the thing, too. I mean, but the other thing, you can also look at it as you're not expecting your 2025 pick to be a super high pick in the first place. So exactly. if, if, if they do trade it, I think that would be the reasoning. And it would for me, it would, it would depend on what you're getting back. If you're getting more than just a, a pick, right? And you it, like if you're trading your pick and a future first, I'm not saying like I don't want to trade the ninth pick and the 2025 first round pick to get six unless I'm getting another player back from yeah. you know what I mean? Like like like, yeah. like that's that's where I'm at right now. Uh in terms of the other players on that list that the Grizzlies are interested in, uh, I mean, as y'all know, I always talk about it. Y'all know I'm a Tennessee fan as much as I, I, I hate to say it. I know we got a lot of Tigers fans to so watch this. I'm sorry. But uh, Dalton Connect, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> if if he's there or not, I think they take him. Like, that, that's how I feel. I don't know if he's going to be there or not. I think the Spurs really like him from what I've heard at eight. So that might be a thing. Uh, I, I don't think they're going to trade up for him. I think that would make a lot of pick. Uh, that pick would make a lot of sense. Uh, I think Devin Carter would make sense as well. Uh, but it would also depend on who it, it, it will depend on if you're trading a guy, like if you're trading a Marcus Smart somewhere and you draft Devin Carter, it, yeah. it will be something like that. Uh, and I'll say the Smart same for thing. Jared Allen. <laughs> yeah, like if, if something like that happens and then they end up drafting Devin Carter, not to say that Devin Carter is going to come out of college and, and immediately be Marcus Smart. Like that's, yeah. that's how patients, but you know, he's going to be making less money. He's obviously a great defender. Uh, the shooting is streaky, right? I know this last year was his best shooting year. I know he shot, I think he shot like 37% from three yeah. this year. So the shooting is streaky, and that would be like my only thing. I'm like, oh, I don't really know about like the shooting part of it, but he does everything else. I mean, he averaged like nine rebounds a game as a guard, right? So six three guard. He, exactly. So he's he's gonna do all the little things. And he's a coach's son. Like he's a, he, he's a coach's son, former player's son. So he knows like what it takes to get onto an NBA court, and I feel like he's gonna—he's the type of dude that's gonna do all the little things that we just talked about watching the Celtics. Like he's gonna be the guy that's gonna get the big offensive rebound and kick it out to Desmond Bain for three or something, something like that. You know what I mean? He do all the dirty he, work. He's the type of dude that will do the dirty work, so I would not be mad at that. Uh, and then with Dalton, he's not as good of a defender. I think he's—you uh, know—he's a. You know, he's a he, he's not bad. He's not great. He he He's not somebody that you have to hide on defense, but he's also not somebody that you want guarding the best player on the other team. Right. Uh, he's average. But, that's cool. That's fine. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I think what he brings on offense will make up for it. I think day one, he is a 38 plus percent shooter on catch on. And it might be 40 plus percent on catch and shoot opportunities. Like that's, he, he is that level of shooter, and when you look at his workouts, you look at the way he played at Tennessee, I, I see that getting him on the court. And then I there's still a lot more to his game as well. I really feel like if, if I said he had a ceiling, just watching his tape and looking at the numbers, like he had, he had very similar numbers to like Desmond Bain in college, right? But he's a little bit taller. Now, I'm not going to say he's going to be averaging 25 points a game in year four, but you're talking about his ceiling, I think he has like – he he could end up being at that point at some point. Like if you're talking about the best he could possibly be, I'm not saying he's going to be there. I think in terms of what he probably will be is a dude that might be a six man, right? He he, he could be a six, six man of the year candidate, right? I, I could see him being that as well. Uh, but he definitely has a ceiling of somebody who could be like just a pure three level scorer, and you, that, 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 that's what you need. You need as many three level scores as possible. Like if you, and especially when you look at the Grizzlies who have struggled, especially in getting like some shots in the mid range, not to say, I know it's 2024. People don't like mid range jumpers anymore, but like, sometimes you got to have somebody, you got to have somebody that can knock those down too. And he, he was awesome in the mid range when he was in college. Uh, so I like that. Uh, Johnny Furphy, not, I, I haven't watched a ton of Johnny Furphy. He's a younger player. He didn't. I feel like at Kansas, he never really showed all of his potential. I think he. I think he could be one of those guys that's a better NBA player 
than he looked in college. But I just don't know if that's a guy that you take in nine. So, oh, yeah, uh, no. and then and then same thing, uh, Tr- I, Tristan De Silva. I do like him because he does have a proven track record of being like a solid shooter as well. Uh, so that's that's something that's really important to me uh, because it, 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 in order for you to be on the court, especially if you're going to be playing with Ja, like you, I want as many guys that are shooting 37, 38 plus percent from three as possible because he's going to create a lot of open looks on his drives to the basket. Um, and that's what you need. They need shooters. So obviously Vince and Gigi are going to help with that this year. But as we're seeing now, you can never have too many shooters on your team. Right. So basically anybody that you get, if you're not, if you're not going center, you got to have a guy that's shooting 37 plus percent from three. Yeah. Or they got to be like Devin Carter where they're doing crazy stuff like everywhere else. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, to start, I guess you, I, with Kinnett, I think again, he's a guy where again, all these moves kind of depend on what they do, like with the trade or not trade. Cause I feel like they're going to make a move. And so I feel like regardless of the move they make, that will determine kind of what the pick happen, what, what happens with the pick. I, I, that's kind of where I'm feeling at. So like you said, if they trade, say smart for Jared Allen, I think they go Devin Carter because he does smart type of things. Um, you know, a guy where, you know, when you talk about Carter, like he's a guy where um, he's not going to wow you with his scoring. Like he's not going to do anything of that nature, but he does all the little stuff. Like you said, like he averaged six rebounds for a career average nine last season. It's crazy. And he also the last two seasons averages two, basically two steals on a block at, at six, three. Like that's, I don't think people understand how crazy that kind of is. And again, he wasn't efficient a lot from three was not great. He was decent from the field. And again, I think a lot of that has to also consider the situation too. Like he's probably he's on that on those teams, he's probably taking a lot more threes, like as the main guy. Where here he's going to be more of a just a a role player. So I feel like those percentages also could go up because of that. Where he's more of a of a role guy versus being like a main option, as we just talked about with a guy like I'm not saying he's Drew Holiday, but but Drew Holiday's in a different situation where he's more efficient because he's taking less shots. So stuff like that, I think, will help. Um, and he would make sense, obviously, his, his dad's here. Um, for Kinnett, I mean, again, I think best case scenario for him is, like, him being uh, uh, Bogdanovich from Atlanta. Like, and when I watch his tape, that's basically kind of what I, I, I see him as, like, best case scenario is a guy that, you know, comes off the bench and kind of provides a scoring punch for you. That could be, like, a guy that gets you, like, 10 to 15 a night, um, shoot league average from three, um, you know, and again, I, I think he's probably a better athlete than Mogdanovich, obviously a little bit. I think they're probably around the same height. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the role for him is the Bogdanovich role from Atlanta. I think that's kind of the role for him. And I mean, that would be helpful on this team, especially um, a guy that makes shots and can not only make shots, but kind of, and you know, do some things maybe like secondary, you know, like real quick, run a pick and roll and be able to make the right read or be able to attack a closeout like that. That adds value to this team. Um, Furphy's a guy where I feel like, again, I think that's more of like a, like if they trade down and they feel like Furphy's a guy that they really like and they could, cause again, for me, I look at all, a lot of these picks, especially even, especially if you trade down as a guy that's not going to be part of your main rotation. And if they are, they're like the 10th or 11th best man. So like, they're going to be more of a, like a development piece. Like they will be more like hustle status, quote unquote. Uh, so, you know, Furphy, I wouldn't mind if you trade down, you get, you know, you're big and this and that and you trade, you get him and he's you're like 11th or 12th guy. That's perfectly fine because again, if he develops, he's going to be a six eight wing that can possibly shoot league average from three. He adds value as a rebounder because I when he did start and show his value, he that's where he really started to play well. Is when he was starting and he started, he started knocking out shots. He was playing off the ball well, so you could see him project as an NBA role player at least as a three and D guy. Um, De Silva, um, I'm not you know I had I didn't really watch much of him uh, in terms of college. But I, I do, you know, I've seen his numbers. I've seen a little bit of his tape. Like, again, he shoots, you know, he has a track record of shooting from three. And that encourages me. Uh, again, I'm not big on guys that only shoot. If you're going to draft them to be projectable NBA shooters, I need I, you need at least two, at, at, for me, at least three probably of, like, real track record um, shooting. That's why there's no surprise that Vince Williams came in and – Right now, out of that draft class, he's the best. Oh, out of that draft class that the Grizzlies had that they drafted, he's the best shooter out of that class. It's no surprise because he had a track record of three years where he shot, I think, 36, 37% from three. 
So that always is going to add up versus where you had a guy like David Roddy who only had one year of shoot 42%, and every other year he was like 28% or like 31%. You just need the track record. Track record is always going to scream, hey, this player is that to some extent. Um, yeah, so, I mean, especially if, if, yeah, if you're a multiple year player, like it's different. Yeah. If, if you if you only play one year, like there's only so much you can do. Yeah, you can. Only, you got to go back to like college. You got to go back to like high school stats and stuff like that. Like that's yeah, that's tough. yeah, exactly. But it's like, it, and it's it's hard when it gets to that because it depends on where you play it at and all kind. Of, like you know, people keep stats. Yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah. it's it's hard. But in terms of guys that have played like multiple years, like and that that is one reason why I I I would not be mad at the silver thing because I mean, if you look at it, I mean, he basically uh, his last two years was a 36 plus percent uh, shooter or 39 plus percent his last two years. And then his sophomore year, he shot 37, right? Like the only year he really struggled from three was his freshman year. And I mean, there's so much stuff that goes into being a freshman in college on top of like, in terms of like, you're already playing tougher competition uh, there's so much other different stuff that goes into that of like you're being away from your family for the first time. Maybe you think like you're not getting the ball as much as you're expecting to. Uh, but, you know, he didn't start any games his freshman year, but he was a starter his last three years. And in all three of those last three years, he was a really good shooter. And, yeah, and I think he barely played that freshman year. Like he only played, I think I'm looking at it, he only played like nine minutes a game freshman year. And really exactly. Like, exactly. So, so. It, 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 there's context to it. There's context yeah. to it, right? And, and I think that's that's the thing is you got to have context and what what all is going on with, uh, like I said, so three years of being 37 plus percent, two years of being 39 percent shooter. I see that as a positive. I see that as you, like you said, you have a track record of being a shooter more than just you got hot your last year or like, you know, the contract year boost, maybe not the contract year, but the draft year boost. Yeah. Where you're like, <laughs> hey, well, we got to get drafted this year. So yeah. you, you, you're just playing out of your mind. Uh, not to say that nobody can do that or whatever. Like, I think not to say that you can't draft a good player by looking on one season, but it's just more likely that they'll come back down to earth, especially when they get to the NBA. It's a deeper it's a deeper three. First of all, you're playing against better defenders, better competition. You're not going to get as many open looks just in general. So that that's why having the two, three seasons of, you know, being a real shooter, I think that's huge, especially for this, like I said, for this Grizzlies team. Because, I mean, you look at this year, obviously there was injuries. They shoot so many threes. They were near the top in threes, but near the bottom in three-point percentage, right? So that's and that that's just the issue. <laughs> so you yeah. got to get guys that can knock down those shots. They're, they're, you're going to get open looks. I mean, they were getting open looks this year. Uh, some of those open looks were looks that other teams were okay with them get, okay with them getting. They're like, okay, yeah. you can take as many shots as you want because they didn't have shooters on the floor on the floor. Uh, so, and, and that's why I said like, if they go somewhere else and get a center elsewhere, and then they stick with a Dalton, uh, maybe that allows you to open up more room and try to trade a Canard or somebody like that. Because not to say, like I said last week, Dalton is not going to come in and shoot. 48 percent from three but i feel like he's going to do a lot of other stuff that luke doesn't do uh and i'm not saying you have to trade him if that happens but it just it, it would get really heavy like at the guard spot uh, yeah it, it, it's literally just a not politics thing but it's literally just objective basketball sense you paying already three guys that are under six four why would you keep another six four guard where you can use him as an asset to get at something that you need more of it's just it's just it's just simple business stuff you know what i mean so when we talk about these players getting traded it's not it's nothing personal it's always about like and the best interest in the team and how it makes sense. So, yeah, you know, Luke is no, you know, no exclusion to that. So, yeah, for sure. And then it's like, uh, the, and, and then there's always the other guys. I know they haven't, like, I, I'm I'm still really high on Ron Holland. I, that's another guy I don't think is going to be there or none. Like, the more that I hear, the more that people say. He shouldn't fall past six, in my opinion. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's, that's what I'm saying. But like you said, this is a draft where you don't really know that. Yeah, but, I don't know that yet. But like there. maybe maybe two months ago, I would have been like, okay, he might be there or not. As more and more stuff comes out, especially with the Matas Buzela stuff coming out, where his seven foot wingspan has now shrunk to like six six. I'm like, I, that came out. I was like, wait, so y'all just been lying about this man for the last like year? They say this man had a seven foot wingspan. They measured him as he was a six six. I think I, I I'm not gonna say he's gonna fall completely out of the lottery. 
but I think he's gonna that's gonna cause him to fall a little bit, just because they're not gonna see as much maybe defensive potential as you once thought was there. Not to say he was gonna be a great defender, but you know if you have the plus wingspan and have the length, that's always good to have on the court. So I feel like that could cause him to fall, uh, and it also might you know cause a guy like Ron Holland to move up some guys draft boards. Whereas maybe some people were like they w- would have rather have Buzelis over Ron Holland. Probably wouldn't say that as much now, you know, learning more about that. Uh, and then, like, the defensive potential Ron Holland has. I think he has the potential to be a really good defender as well. Uh, but, yeah, th- like, this this draft class, like, we're going to continue to say, it's going to be really hard to kind of pinpoint who's going to be going where just because I feel like there are so many guys that are kind of, like, on similar levels in terms of what kind of player they could be in the league. Um, not, I don't think we have like generational talents in this draft. I think that's the thing. I mean, you could say Sar, like, or, or not, not generational, but like all star local player. Like, I think Sar ha- probably has a chance to be that, and he's going to be a great defender day one, obviously. But it, 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 you, if you're looking for role players or somebody to kind of like round out your roster or round out your rotation, I do think this is a good draft. And I think that's why there's been a lot of reports saying that despite people saying this is a weak draft, the Grizzlies actually really do like this draft because it is a lot of guys that you can kind of round out your rotation with. With the second apron, you know, kind of looming now and worries about that because you know you're paying Jai, you know you're paying Bane, you know you're paying Jaren. Uh, you're paying Smart a good amount of money. Luke Kennard is supposed to be getting like 15 mil. So it's like you're looking at all these guys. Eventually you're going to have to continue to pay these people having Gigi and Vince on those small contracts is going to be huge. And then if you can get good value out of a lottery pick, that's only making three, $4 million. Yeah. That's, that's huge. And, and, lo- and locked in for like four years too, like four years. And locked in for four years. And that's like, and, 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 and that's why like a De Silva or a connect or somebody like that, I'd be okay with. Cause they're also older already. So it's like, I feel like they're going to be more NBA ready like the day they come in, like they might not have as high have a ceiling as somebody like Ron Holland, but you know, if it takes Ron Holland two or three years to reach that ceiling, maybe you'd rather have somebody who can come in and maybe in 10 years, he's not going to be the better player, but he's going to be a really good role player day one. And for those four years where he is coming off the bench, he can be one of your better role players. So yeah, and and you can, that, you can that's kind of harder. Hard. Oh, you can set it for Carter and Klingon too, because Car- Klingon's a two-year guy, and then Carter was like a three-year guy. So those guys, like, they have a little bit of track record. Even though I talked about Klingon being bad, there's stuff that he does good. Like, I know he could come in right away and do some stuff. So you know what I mean? So I think that's the good thing about all the guys that they're interested in. I think the only person that doesn't really have the experience is uh, Furphy. That's really it. Outside of that, everybody else has like three or four years of – or like at least two, two to three years of like college experience, and you kind of know what they are. And, and we know that that's what the Grizzlies like. The Grizzlies like getting older players. Yeah. Where a yeah. lot of teams kind of they, – they don't want the four-year players and stuff like that. The Grizzlies have had a track record of getting guys that have played multiple years as well. Uh, not as much as – not as much in the lottery. Uh, obviously, they did draft Gigi in the second round. and He was the youngest player in the draft, so that kind of went away from that. But you look at Vince Williams, he was a, you know, three-, four-year player. Uh, Bain was a four-year player. Brandon Clark was a multiple year play, like guys that played more than one year in college. That's kind of, that's kind of what their MO, uh, even LaRavia played more than one year in college. So it's like that, that that's the type of guys that they usually go for. So that's why I'm not surprised at any of the names on the list. That, that's why Furphy did surprise me just a little bit, but I also feel like that is more of a, if we trade back, we're going to still yeah. look at you. You might come in for a workout just in case because they're keeping all their options on the table. And that's my number one. That's the thing I'm still happy about is they haven't jumped on anything, right? I think that they should wait to as close to the draft as possible before they really make these decisions because we all know that when you get close to the draft, that's when more teams start to get desperate. The offers you're getting now are, <laughs> not, are probably not going to be the best offers you're going to get. When you start getting – so one or two days before the draft, and some of these teams are like, okay, we got to get rid of this pick. You're going to get some better offers than you're probably getting right now. So I'm glad they haven't jumped the gun on anything. Uh, if there's something, you know, that you can't miss or if it's, you know, the a Jared Allen trade like we've been talking about that you really enjoy, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be mad if they went ahead and jumped on it now. But if you're talking about trading up, you might wait until the day before the draft or even the night of the draft. I mean, that's when a lot of – 
that's when we see a lot of the, the trades is actually on draft night. Yeah, so, or that or that or that week of. That's usually when it happens. Like every time, it's yeah. usually right that week, seven days before. Usually that window is when teams make trades for either other players, like you said, Jared Allen, somebody like that, or like make deals like that. Because that's what the Grizzlies did with uh, I think the Zaire and Stephen Adams stuff. I think that was like a week. Or like a couple days like after the finals and like a few days before the draft started. So that, that that's usually when you'll see a lot of act, you know, act action going on, activity going on. Yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, uh, we're gonna keep giving y'all all the new draft news and stuff as it comes out. Uh, like you said, only about 16 days away from the draft actually starting. Two day draft for the first time. Going to be interesting uh, to see, especially because. We're not going to know everybody in the Grizzlies are going to get on that first night. So there there could be some overnight trades between round one and two. That could be interesting. Uh, might get some 3 a.m. Woj bombs about some second round picks or something. Uh, so that's going to be really cool. Uh, but, yeah, NBA drafts, always fun. Uh, and it's going to be cool to see who they draft and then how they really perform when they go to Summer League. Uh, because there's going to be – I mean, some, Summer League is going to be cool this year. I think the Grizzlies are going to have a lot of stuff to kind of experiment with. Uh, but last thing today, uh, some big news in the women's game. Uh, always got to talk about this as well. Team USA women's basketball roster was announced. Uh, and then just go in alphabetical order uh, from Team USA website. Nafisa Collier, Kalia Copper, Chelsea Gray, Brittany Griner, Sabrina Onescu, Jewel Lloyd, Kelsey Plum, Brianna Stewart, Diana Taurasi, Alyssa Thomas, uh, Asia Wilson, and Jackie Young. So, uh, I mean, I, I think it's a good roster. Uh, obviously, a couple questions is really like the injuries because there's a couple people that they got on there. Like Chelsea Gray hasn't played in like seven months because she got yeah, her almost, almost a year. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's insane. Like Chelsea Gray hasn't played. But based on all, all everything that, that I've been hearing and everything, like based on how she looks on the bench, she's not on crutches. She's been getting hype and stuff like it. It looks like she's getting close. Obviously, we're not really sure if it's going to be like a – not to say that I know she's healthy enough to play 40 minutes, right? That That's not the case. But I feel like she's moving in the right direction, and I think she will play WNBA games before the end of this month, right? Before the end of June, I think we will see Chelsea Gray back. Uh, but that, that, that that's one of the – that's a question mark is her health. Uh, Brittany Griner has some injury issues, but she came back and I and I watched that game today where the Sparks and Wings went to double overtime and she played really well. Uh, and then uh, that, that that that's really the only concerns is like injuries to me. Uh, I like that they had multiple aces, obviously uh, <laughs> multiple people from the Connecticut Sun, because I think they're prioritizing some team chemistry as well. Uh, just because of that, Kalia Copper has been playing awesome. Has been and has been super clutch for the Sun. Uh, Diana Taurasi going for what her sixth <laughs> or yes sixth gold medal. Like that is that's insane. That's really insane to think about. Uh, and then you know Brianna Stewart going for her third. So like you know they they got a lot of people on here that have been on teams in the past. Uh, and I mean I think I think they'll they're they're. The expectation is always to win the gold for both Team USA teams. But, I mean, looking at this roster top to bottom, it's hard to see them not winning at all. Like, I, it, it, it's going to be crazy. Like, this is really – like, they, they talk about the men's team being the Avengers. When you talk about the women's team compared to the, the rest of the world, it's not just the Avengers. It's like the Avengers, the Justice League, uh, every other superhero team is all together on the same team. This, this is basically what it's like. You got Superman and Spider-Man and Batman, and who, yeah. whoever it is, dude. It, it is insane. So, they, like, I, I, I really do like the way they built the team. Uh, and I'm excited for, you know, some of the first-time, like, Olympians as well. Like, Kalia Copper has never played. Uh, Sabrina. I think she's played in FIBA, but I don't think she's played in the Olympics before. Uh, Alyssa Thomas, you know, actually hasn't played in the Olympics before, which actually kind of surprised me. And I have to yeah, that's crazy. Like, yeah. that's crazy. Like, that was kind of surprising, but I know she did had, had some injuries and stuff like that. Uh, but really awesome to see Alyssa Thomas get that nod as well. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, no, this team, I mean, I mean, it, you know, I, I don't got many words about the team. I mean, in terms of like, like, they're going to be good, like, like you said, a lot of these team, a lot of these players from the same team. You know, you got Brianna Stewart, Sabrina, 
they, you know, they're playing together now. Brandon Stewart played with Jewel Lloyd, obviously, in Seattle for a little bit. Plum, obviously. Jackie Young, Kelsey, um, Asia, they all play together. Diana Taurasi, Griner, um, Copper all play together with a Mercury. Like, so you, the only one that really hasn't is like uh, maybe Alyssa and like Collier. That's really it. But even then, Collier, I'm pretty sure, has played with all these other, like, you know what I mean? They played in the last Olympics. So, like, you know, you have all that going for it. So, you know, there's a lot of chemistry there. Um, you know, I expect them to win. I, I don't really, you know, there's, like you said, this is, Compare especially in the women's game, like they 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 probably gonna blow out, respectfully, they're probably gonna blow out teams. Like I, I I expect that. Like that's my expectation. They're gonna blow out teams. Like Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart to me the best two players in the world. They're on the same team. You know what I mean? And then you can say Nafisa Kali is like the third best player, or Alyssa Thomas is the fourth best player. Basically, they have the top four players in the in the W on the same team, essentially, or top four or five, whatever you want to call it, whatever order, whatever right. And they're on the same team, like. It's just it's gonna be ridiculous, but I, I don't really got too much on it because you know how it was because there was people because the Shams report was initially because you know how people had the conversation about Caitlin Clark being left off and this and that, and it's like you know again Caitlin's good, but I tell people like you know like she's good, but again like these players are more established. Obviously, they're better players right now. Like you know like Caitlin's not gonna be there. Like and this is because you know certain people will make it about basketball, some people make it about the whole popularity aspect. It's about basketball then they like they pick the players that made the most sense for what they're trying to do, which is accomplish goal. Not to say Caitlin won't get there. Caitlin will be on some Olympic teams down the line. Like we know this, like as long as she's healthy, health dependent, she's going to be on Olympic teams, you know, down the line. Like Diana Taurasi, like you said, this is going for six or seven. Like she's the, not to say she's at the end, but I mean, she's closer to the end of her career than to the beginning. So, you know, hey, spots I'll were- say it. This, this is her last Olympics. We know this. Yeah. Gonna- yeah, yeah, yeah. Last Olympics. There's not, last- not going to be a seven. Like, yeah, there's not gonna be seven. Yeah, yeah, she this should be like 45, something crazy. But point being is there's gonna be spots essentially, like there's gonna be spots available down the line. So, you know, it's not a big deal that Caitlin missed this time. Obviously, she's gonna use his motivation as she should, but like it's not really a big discussion to me. Like, I'd never expect her to be on the team anyway, and that's no disrespect to her, you know what I mean? Like, I think she's great, she's gonna be rookie of the year, but like this team is was going to be always like established players, in my opinion. Just I just that's where I always thought. I never thought, oh yeah, Caitlin's going to be Olympic. Like, no, I just never thought about it. Like I thought it was going to be always. But this is a great team. Like I said, like I didn't know who was all going to be on the team, but this is a really great team. Um, I might be a little bit biased and say Ryan Howard should have got Howard here on the team somehow, but I'm an Atlanta fan, so that's kind of like. But I, again, even then, I look at it. I'm like, who who spot you going to take? You know what I mean? Like I don't know. You know, like maybe. Yeah, no, that, that's- yeah, like, that's the tough part. Who yeah. whose spot are they actually going to take? Like that's that's really the tough part for me. Yeah, because you got players that missed out. Like I can, you know, like you like you said, like a Ryan or shoot even a Neca, like Enrique, 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 Enrique. Like you know, like there's players that are going to probably be all W and miss out. Like it just it's part of it. Like you only got twelve spots. And, and I, I, they should be doing it again this year where they have Team USA versus the All Star team. Yeah, right? they do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, Hey, that might be that might be a little spicy. That might be a little spicy because there's gonna be a couple people on that all-star team that probably think they should be on team USA. And yeah. you know, like and and like you said with Caitlin, I mean, I don't think she I don't think she was able to do training camp because she was in the final four. Yeah, right? she was. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. one of those things where it's like that training camp is where you compete for the spot, and she wasn't able to go. And you know, is it and it's it's usually pretty rare for rookies to make it. Like, the only rookies that have made it in the past was, like, Candace Parker, Brianna Stewart, like, players like that. Which is not to say that Caitlin isn't a player that, you know, she was all-time leading scorer in college. She's awesome. But also, in terms of, like, her getting ready for the physicality of, like, the international game as well, I think it's similar to the WNBA. And she's going to have to be, you know, a little bit of a better defender and stuff like that. So th- there are some parts, uh, like, to say – it's one of those things where if Caitlin Clark had made the team – it's not like I would have been mad about it. Like I get it because she's yeah. an awesome player, and I think if she had made the team, I mean they were that they, they were going to win gold with or without her on the team. Like it's like let's let's yeah. be. Honest. I'll say this: yeah. if she's not on the team in twenty twenty eight, then we're gonna have some discussions. Okay. Yeah. But this year, I'm like she's a rookie. She didn't go to training camp. There, I think there are some other options. Uh, and now I did see some people saying that they thought she didn't make the team because they were they were worried. Because of her popularity, if she didn't get enough playing time, people. Were, I was like, no, I don't like if, if now. If you if you told me that the reasoning is because 
you were worried about her popularity or you're worried that she's too popular to sit on the bench and people are going to be mad that she's not playing. Like that would be a dumb reason to not put her on the team, right? You can't yeah. let fan narrative determine whether or not somebody's going to be on the team. But yeah, all the reason, the, the stuff that made sense to me was like, she, she, was, she wasn't at the training camp, right? It's not her fault. Um, and it would be different if they had put like a different rookie, like if they had put like an Angel Reese or somebody on the team yeah. or Cardoso and they didn't put Caitlin, then you could maybe have an argument but everybody they put on the team, like you said, like who who is she going to replace? And I do think if – I'm pretty sure she's she's one of the alternates as, as far as I know. Like so if Probably. somebody does get hurt, I wouldn't be surprised if she's on the short list. So if Chelsea Gray isn't 100% healthy, I think that's when you could see an Enrique, possibly a Caitlin Clark, somebody like that that will make the team. Uh, and I, I, I will say I was also really glad at the way she kind of responded to it because she didn't let the media bait her into one of those clip bait answers. Uh, she, she didn't let that happen. She just you know, said she was happy for all the players. They called her before the news came out. So it's not like she found out because of Sham's tweet or something. And I think that was really important too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think top to bottom, it <laughs> it's going to be crazy. I mean, both like the men's team and the women's team, like pound for pound. In, in terms, like, I mean... Obviously, I haven't watched every Olympics that they've ever done. But in terms of the ones I've seen, when you look at both of these teams, this might be the best the best team for, like, both sides. It, it, it's, it's pretty insane just looking at just looking at top to bottom. Yeah, and I, and I want to say especially for uh, the men's team to some extent because there's a, a lot of guys that we haven't seen in a while. Brian ain't played in a while. Uh, Steph, I don't think Steph has even had a, I think if I'm not mistaken, Steph hasn't played. Yeah, it hasn't. Yeah. Which which is crazy. Doesn't sound right. But if you think about it in 2016, he was hurt during the finals. 2020, he had broke his hand. So it's like, it makes sense. And then in 2012, he was still kind of young. I don't think he he had really established himself as one of the best players in the league yet. So when you go back and think about it, it does make sense, but it also doesn't make sense because this is a guy that, I mean, most people, if he's not top 10, he's a top 15 player to ever walk the planet. Yeah. And he's the best shooter in the world. So that that, that one was kind of crazy. It, 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 that, that, it surprised me. But then you go back and think about it, it's like, yeah, that's right. I guess he never made the team. So yeah. uh, I, both sides, it's, it's, it's going to be awesome. The Olympics, I'm very excited for the Olympics this summer. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, it's just really the men's team. Because, like, the women's team I'm excited for. But, like, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is more so it's like the women's team, a lot of them, I won't say a lot of them, but – some of them are on the last team that won it, right? So I'm not, you know, the chemistry is there. This this team is like not completely different. There's a couple like Tatum was on the last one, KD was on the last one, but like for the most part, this is like guys that we ain't seen play together in a while. Like most of the time, we see these guys play all star teams together, like LeBron and Steph and KD. Like we don't usually see them in the Olympics. Like we seen KD and Bron in the Olympics, but we ain't seen Steph. Like add Steph to that, you know what I mean? And you know, like you like we said, like with Diana Taurasi, same for Braun and KD and stuff. This probably their last Olympics. So, you know what I mean? Like we, you know, we we need to enjoy this because we ain't gonna see this again. Probably more than likely, we're not gonna see these guys again playing in the Olympics, like all together. So just enjoy it. Cause again, you know, people, you know, people like the, you know, I always say the future's now, old man. I say that, you know, and I say that half jokingly, because you know, I'm here for the young talent, but appreciate the older talent. Cause again, like they're one of one. So you know, you don't get to see them play together a lot because most of the time they don't get that chance in the regular, you know, in the NBA because different teams, all that salary, you know, all that stuff. So when you get all that talent on one team, you, you know, you want to see them play at their best. So it it definitely be exciting on both sides. Um, I expect both teams to take um, gold, obviously. Now, I I think women more so men's because not saying men's is an underdog, but like, I feel like there's a lot more talent on that men's side. You're international wise where, you know, you got to worry about them a little bit, you know, like, you know, you got to worry about France a little bit. You know, obviously Canada hey, got some I will talent. say this. I will say, and this is the last day, especially on the men's side, uh, we lucky that Yugoslavia is not one country no more. Because <laughs> <laughs> they would have had Luka Jokic and the Bogdanoviches. I'm like, I'm not saying they would have win. They would win, but that's that's gonna, that would be a tough matchup. That would be a tough yeah, matchup. Yeah, that would that, 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 be tough. Yeah, and so, Fran- yeah, France is gonna be good, tough. too. Especially because Nicholas Batum, I'm sure he's gonna be on the team. Nicholas Batum in the Olympics is like insane. It's like <laughs> he's like a Patty Mills, Patty Mills, too. Patty Mills, Patty Mills, Patty Mills, Patty Mills, 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 M
And Wimby, we know what Wimby is. Like, dude, Wimby's he's not even he's not even from Earth. It's <laughs> like he's he's now, 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 now they're not gonna have no gold because they're not gonna have no gold team rule either, ain't they? Or they don't have that oh, rule. I didn't even, oh yeah, that's nasty. yeah, yeah. So I, he can just do whatever he wanna do. Yeah, <laughs> he can do yeah, go no gold tending. He's been a smile the whole time. So yeah, that, that's what I'm it's gonna be tough for men. Oh, and there's no defense of three seconds either. Yeah, so he can stay, yeah. So it's gonna be oh, it's gonna be a little bit tougher. Yeah, yeah. it's that's gonna be fun though. <laughs> Yeah, but it's gonna be a little bit tougher. Whereas women's side, I they think they're gonna fix that. You know, they will have to yeah. fix that, man. I'm sorry. They be <laughs> that's right insane now. to think about. But yeah, like yeah. I said, it's, it's gonna be awesome. I'm excited, like for both sides. Excited the women's team getting announced. Uh, it's gonna be interesting, obviously, with the WNBA taking a break. I think it actually will be good. I think that's another thing to say for like the people that are mad about Caitlin not making the team. You should honestly probably be happy that she's actually getting a break because she didn't oh, get an off season. So she's probably actually gonna get off season. All the rookies, like, and that and that's one thing that I am happy about for the rookies is like all the rookies, whether it's you know Cardosa, uh, Rakia Jackson, uh, Aaliyah Edwards, who's been playing well. I mean, all of them are are adjusting to the WNBA lifestyle. I feel like that Olympic break is gonna help the ones that didn't make it, and their time is coming, right? So like that 28-28 team, I think it's gonna look a lot different. I think you will see a lot of the young players that, you know, people have come to the WNBA this year to watch are going to be on that team. Uh, and it's going to be in America. It's going to be in Los Angeles in 2028. So that's going to be even cooler to watch. Ooh, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be crazy. Yeah, 2028 team might be crazy for men and women. Yeah, that's going to be kind of nuts, especially being at home. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't even know. Listen, obviously, look, throw a little grizzly plug. Imagine, like, you get, like, 2028, you get, like, Josh or somebody on there. In the Olympics, that'd be great. Oh my goodness, that, that that's but that's 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 far down the line. That's four years down, the line. but that'd be great. Yeah. See, now you got me thinking about twenty twenty eight. I forgot. I didn't because I forgot it was in L A. Yeah, that's gonna be yeah, that 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 might be dope. Yeah, that next, might be. Then podcast might have to make a trip. Might have to make a trip. To oh LA. my god, yeah, to L A. <laughs> uh, that would be. Good. But uh, like I always say, I appreciate everybody who listened to this week's episode of the Next Gen Podcast here on the Bluff City Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Bryson Wright, and I was joined by my co-host, Alex Winton, and we will see y'all next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Gen Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and a comment wherever you download your podcasts. Head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co where you will find comprehensive coverage of all things Memphis sports and how you can become an insider. We'll see you back here next time.